Our scripture lesson today is taken from the first letter of John, chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 2. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking, walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Well, as you know, tomorrow there's this eclipse happening and people are going a little nuts, okay? And it was not helped by the earthquakes that we had. That only added to a little bit of the hysteria around what's happening tomorrow. And so they're going a little crazy and you're seeing people post stuff like this. I'm not sure how many of them actually believe it. I think some of the people posting the stuff are doing it just to get a rise out of other people because they just enjoy um, increasing anxiety in the world, okay? Because, you know, we clearly don't have enough. So I, I think they're just trying to, to do that to us. But one of the things that I find interesting is that all these folks who are posting stuff about needing to repent because Jesus is coming tomorrow or whatever is going to happen tomorrow, they're always talking about the other person needing to repent, yeah, I never see the person who sits there and says, oh, you know, I think that there's something really significant happening. I think Jesus might be coming tomorrow, so I need to repent, okay? I need to be worried about me and my being good with God. Instead, they're all posting about what you need to do. You need to repent. You need to be ready because it's never about themselves. They think it's about other people because they always overestimate themselves. And this is one of the things you find in surveys of all kinds, right? You see surveys of drivers, uh, and basically everybody thinks they're an above-average driver, and, it, and everything is only the other person's fault. My favorite was about 15 years ago or so, they did a survey of Presbyterian ministers and asked themselves to, uh, to rate themselves on a scale of one to five, five being good, one being lousy, on how they were as a preacher. Zero responded with a one or a two. They did not survey the congregants. <laughs> and so I thought that was really kind of telling, all right? But this tendency to overestimate ourselves is something that John is talking about in this letter. When he, he says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, to be fair, I don't think I've ever met a person who says, I never sin, all right? You occasionally meet a person who thinks, who says, you know, yes, I sinned, but the last one was seven years ago. But, you know, you really don't have anybody who says, I never sin. But at the same time, you rarely meet someone who says that sin is their inclination, all right? That, that sin is what they tend toward, all right? And this is one of the issues that we have theologically when we talk about this issue of sin is the question of, of who we are versus what we do. And the word gets used in both senses. You see, sin is a state that we're in. We're in a state of sin. Uh, and the state of sin is basically this desire to sin. All right, The state of sin is the state of brokenness from God, a state where our instincts are not right. Okay, Our instincts aren't good. All right. Then there are sins, which are actions, the things that we know that we do that aren't right. Now, we prefer to use words like mistakes, 
you know, I, I, I messed up and say, hey, I'm a mistaker as opposed to a sinner. All right? But the real issue is our state, our status. And John talks about this by using this metaphor of, of light versus darkness, is saying that if we say we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. And what happens is that we're often oblivious to the extent to which we are walking in darkness, which is just a way of saying that we're living in a state in which we're inclined to sin, living in a state in which we're inclined to do the wrong thing. Now, what does that really mean? What that means in a practical sense is that we're living in a state where we've kind of fooled ourselves into thinking that things are right that aren't. And one of the ways in which that happens is, is in the world around us, right? So the world around us, we often talk about how things are messed up in the world around us. And often what's happening is that in the world around us are sets of values that aren't godly. Sets of values that reward things like hoarding, that reward things like greed, that reward things you know, like, like, like stepping on people to get ahead. And what happens is when we give in to that, when we consider that and say, okay, well, I'm a good person, but I'm just, I'm just doing what everyone does. I'm just doing what goes on in the world around us. Then, in fact, we're saying that we're following Christ, but we are, in fact, not. Because we're giving ourselves over to a way of thinking that isn't right. And when we do that, when we give ourselves over to a set of principles, a way of thinking that isn't consistent with God, then we're going to commit the things that God does not want us to do. And so there's this relationship between who we are and what we do and that state of who we are, that state of sin that we're in, leads to the sins. It leads to the things that are wrong. Because the battle begins internally. Right? The battle begins inside. It's when we consider doing the thing that we ought not do that indicates that we're in this state of sin. And then what happens is it tempts us into doing that which is wrong because we've already bought into a set of values that is wrong. On the other hand, what John is telling us is that when he uses this metaphor and he says if we walk in the light, which means that, that we have, we're walking understanding with an illumination of what is actually right and what is wrong, then we have true fellowship with one another. Because we have true fellowship with people when we share values. All right? That's what true community is. True fellowship is when you share values with people. And values are at the root of changed behavior. So as a community that wants to follow Christ, we need to have shared values about things that are right and things that aren't. And those values are at the root of how we're able to actually change our values into conformity with what God would want. Now, there, there was an author, he uh, wrote a book, really big bestseller. His name's James Clear, and he wrote this book called Atomic Habits about six years ago. And, and Felicia and I heard him at the Global Leadership Summit. He spoke last summer at, at, at GLS. Okay? And one of the things that he talks about is this interplay between who you are and what you do and how these things are related to one another. And one of the ways he phrases it is he says, the most effective way to change your habits is to focus not on what you want to achieve, but on who you wish to become. All right? So he draws this distinction where he talks about things that are outcome-based habits. And most of us, when we're trying to change the way we do things, when we're trying to change what we do, we often first think in terms of outcomes. For example, one example he gives is talking is people who talk about, I want to quit smoking. Now, frankly, right now, that's not quite as relevant because I actually don't know, very, I don't know very many smokers anymore. I used to, but I don't know very many. But you have people who say, I want to quit smoking. And then you, you have people, for instance, um, uh, you know, the number one New Year's resolution is, I want to lose weight. Okay? And so that's an outcome that you're desiring. You're sitting there saying, I want to lose weight or I want to quit smoking. I want this particular outcome. And he says that what's more important than seeking the outcome 
is changing your identity. For example, he says that instead of saying, I want to learn to play the guitar, or I want to learn to play the piano, you should have an identity shift that says, I want to be a musician. It's not the outcome that you want, it's the identity that you want. I want to be a musician. And he says the, the power of identity to control your behavior is so strong that we're often having our behavior controlled in negative ways by negative identities that we carry about ourselves. He says, for example, if you sit there and have convinced yourself and a part of your identity is, I'm bad at math, then anything that involves math, you won't even do. You shy away from it, you'll stop doing it, you back away and you say, I'm not even going to try because it looks like math, smells like math, and I'm bad at math, so I'm not going to do it. All right? or, or you sit there and say, I, I'm a person, I'm never on time, so I don't try. I'm never on time. So you have an appointment and you go, you don't even try. You're not ready, you're not even trying because you're always late. It's, be it's become a part of your identity. And so he says that the negative identity that you carry can actually stop you from doing things that you're capable of doing, and that's how powerful identity is. But instead, he says that w one of the things we ought to be trying to do is develop identity-based habits. All right? And identity-based habits come more naturally, because when you have an identity that you decide you're going to have, then the actions are no longer choices. They just flow very naturally from the identity. He, he, one of the examples he gave about smoking is two different ways of a person who's quitting. Like, if you knew people who were trying to quit, I remember, you know, 30, 40 years ago, half my friends smoked and all of them were trying to quit. And someone would offer them a cigarette, and the typical answer was, no thanks, I'm trying to quit. And he says that answer is an outcome-based answer. He said the better answer, the one that works, is to sit there and say, no thanks, I'm not a smoker. That if the person was able to say, hey, I'm, not a, I'm just not a smoker anymore, All right. then it flows more naturally than trying to think about outcomes. He, he gave a really uh, interesting example about a person who had been very successful in life, but he could not defeat the habit of chewing his nails. And so he just chewed his nails, and he just kept chewing his nails, and he couldn't stop chewing his nails. And so he decided to try something. And what he tried was this. He got a manicure. All right? And he said that when he did it, he thought that what was going to deter him from chewing his nails was the cost of the manicure. It's like, oh my gosh, this cost, you know, I paid a fortune for a manicure. I actually don't know how much they cost. I'm presuming they're expensive. <laughs> I myself have never had one. But in any case, <laughs> um, he says that he thought the cost would deter him from chewing his nails. But he said instead, what happened was an identity shift happened. He, be, he looked at his nails and says, I'm a person with nice nails. And it was when the identity shift happened, he says, hey, I have, I have nice nails. Then he stopped wanting to chew them. It, nothing could get him to chew them because he is now a person with nice nails. And if you have nice nails, you don't chew them. And so the identity-based habits all right, just become a natural part of who you are once you convince yourself that this is my new identity. And that is how we can start to achieve what John is talking about when he says, if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, confession confronts what you do. All right, That's the whole point of confession. So the point of confession is to say, I'm acknowledging this is who I am. I'm acknowledging this is what I do. I'm acknowledging my issues. So confession confronts who we actually are. And once we've confronted who we actually are, we can then choose something new. We can then decide we're going to be someone different, and that is how we are cleansed. We become cleansed of our unrighteousness because we've decided not to be that which I just confessed to being. I decide that I'm going to try do something else. And so the way James Clear puts it is pretty simple. He says, number one, decide the type of person you want to be and then prove it to yourself with small wins. Decide who you want to be and then your 
actions will start to prove it to yourself that this is actually who I am. So your identity can create the actions that will then seal your identity. Because it works in a loop like that. The same way sin works in a loop like that. Once you're in that state of sin where you're considering doing what you ought not do and then you commit it, it then reinforces that that's who you are and it's a negative spiral. Instead, you can have the positive spiral of deciding the type of person you want to be and then you act in accordance with it and that helps seal your identity in a positive way. And so as Mr. Clear puts it, he says, true behavior change is identity change. And for us as followers of Christ, the question becomes, where is being a Christ follower sitting with your identity? Is following Christ simply something that you are attaching to some other identity, where you sit there and say, I am whatever, and I also am a Christian. I am whatever, and I also try to follow Christ. Or is being a Christ follower at the center of your identity? Is being a Christ follower your core identity so that it becomes what guides everything that you do? Because when that happens, when you decide that your identity is to be a Christ follower, the question about what you should do in a given situation becomes an easier question and a better question. See, so often the question is, is that a sin? And I always love Andy Stanley, one of my favorite preachers. I mention this statement of his all the time because he, he preaches on, on this fairly often. And he says, you know, that whenever he gets this question, is that a sin? He understands that what the person is saying is that I want to know where the line is between not a sin and sin. So that I can put my toes right up against the line. And that's why, that's why they're asking, is that a sin? Because right? what I really want to do is, I don't, I don't want to cross the line. But I want to get really close to it. Okay? I, I want to just nudge myself right next to it. I want to just nestle right up against that line. I want to move toward it. But I'd be a bad person if I cross over it. But I want to get close. And he said, that's really not the right question, right? And that's not the right way to think about it. Instead, if you are a Christ follower, all right, that line should be something you're trying to get as far away from as possible. That line should be sitting in your rear view mirror. That line should be something that you, want, you don't want to get anywhere close to because you're trying to go in the other direction. You're not trying to head toward the line without crossing it. You're trying to head the other way as far as you can. And so an easier question for us to ask when we're deciding what to do or not is to simply say, is that consistent with being a follower of Jesus? Or is it more consistent? Which of my two choices is more consistent with being a follower of Jesus? Not whether it's a sin or not. Because that's just talking about where that line is. And we don't want to think about that line. We want to, we want to be somewhere over here. We want to be identity driven in Jesus. And that's what John wants for us. See, what John writes is he says, look, I'm writing, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And then he understands that you're still going to mess up. We're still going to mess up. I mess up, you know, every single day, okay? So, so I'm trying to tell you a way of thinking, a way to frame the way you consider your decisions, a way to think about how you want to go through life. And then when you do mess up, because you will, because we're human, we're all going to mess up, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. See clearly who you are. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you are what you aren't. Understand who you are. Try to become a different person. Act accordingly. And then when you slip up, Jesus will forgive you. 
Because what Christ wants from us is, is where we're headed. What Christ wants for us is where our identity is. Right? That it's not supposed to be that our identity is something else and then we attach faith to it, but rather that our core identity be that we are Christ followers at our core who occasionally make a mistake. It's that path toward having Christ follower as the core of our identity that God wants for us. And then what matters is that. What matters is the path that we're on. What matters is having this end goal of having an identity that is fully rooted in Christ. And then the actions that serve that identity come naturally. They just flow out of that. Because when you sit there and say, I am whatever, then you naturally do whatever it is that that is. You naturally do it. If you say, I'm a baseball player, you go field ground balls. Because right? that's what baseball players do. They still make mistakes, but their identity is rooted in that. When our identity is rooted in Christ, we'll still make mistakes. And frankly, I have found this personally to be the most effective way for me to change bad habits of mine. Not all of them. There are certain identities that I have just not lived into at all. <laughs> but it has really helped simplify and motivate me better. Because what happens is that when I sit there and say, you know, I would like to do X, I would like to stop doing this, or I would like to stop doing that, or I would like to start doing that, it becomes easy to, to just decide to let, let it slide. Oh, once won't hurt. Once won't hurt. I, I, can, I can skip this. I can skip that. But when I sit there and say, no, 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 my identity is as a person who doesn't do this. My identity is as a person who does this. I find that to be so much more of a powerful motivator within myself because I don't want to violate my sense of identity. I don't want to violate, uh, you know, uh, my sense of who I am. So I find it to be such a more powerful motivator for me to, to use identity as the basis of my motivation. And I will still mess up. I'll mess up a lot. But the actions that I take in the service of the identity, in the service of what I want to become, flows so much more naturally. It doesn't feel like work anymore. It doesn't feel like striving anymore. It just feels like, oh, great. I just did what I need to do because that's the person I want to be. And so if we decide, that Christ follower is the person we want to be, then all the actions, all the debates about right or wrong, they become simpler, become easier. Because at each juncture, we can just ask ourselves, is this consistent with my identity of being a follower in Christ? And we'll just be doing who we are. Amen.